welcome to a brand new episode of Seize the Moment podcast. And today we have a very special guest. Today we have on Edith Shiro. Uh, she's a clinical psychologist in private practice in Miami, Florida. She special specializes in trauma and post-traumatic growth, holding space and guiding her patients to achieve greater potential and higher consciousness. Dr. Shiro is co-founder of the Trauma and Resilience Center, board member of the World Happiness Foundation, and an active member of Kadena International, providing humanitarian aid and disaster prevention worldwide. She's worked at the Clinic for Survivors of Torture at Bellevue Hospital, the Cambodian Refugee Clinic at Montefiore Medical Center, and the Human Rights Clinical Support Network at Refugee, among others. Using her five-stage model, she offers a blueprint for all her patients to develop coping skills and resilience and to achieve post-traumatic growth. And her newest book, available now, is called The Unexpected Gift of Trauma, The Path to Post-Traumatic Growth. Welcome, Edith. Thank you for coming on. Beautiful. Thank you so, so much. That was a beautiful introduction. I really appreciate it. <laughs> happy to <laughs> be with you. Happy. Very happy to be with you. Absolutely. And so in her book, Edith wrote, if trauma indeed shatters our deepest held beliefs regarding the world and our place in it, is it even possible to grow from it? Can it really be a catalyst for positive transformation? And how is it that some people can go through a horrific experience and remain stuck in pain for years, barely able to function, while others going through the same traumatic event will not only survive, but thrive, not in spite of their experience, but because of it. That is the paradox of trauma. It has both the power to destroy and the power to transform. This paradox has animated my work as a clinical psychologist for more than two decades. To some, it may feel disrespectful or even untrue to insist that growth and transformation can emerge from unspeakable tragedy, yet it can. I have witnessed it over and over again in individuals who have suffered heartbreak and loss, domestic abuse and catastrophic illness, in communities that have endured the worst of the worst, torture, ravages of war, global pandemics, unrelenting racism or homophobia, violence and massive destruction from natural disasters. And I have known it to be true long before I became a clinical psychologist. So I love that. So such excellent writing. So Edith, can we talk about essentially your journey and how you became interested in trauma and essentially how you became a clinical psychologist in the first place? <clears throat> well, this question of how I became a clinical psychologist, you know, I, I always answer, I've always, I think I've always been a psychologist. I have the awareness and consciousness of pretty much being a psychologist. When I was in high school, my friends would call me the, the psychologist of all my friends. I mean, I, that's who I am. That's part of my identity. That's who I am. I love it. Even if I didn't have it <clears throat> professionally, this is what I would do. Uh, and the thing about trauma that I also talk about in the book is that I have like a lineage of trauma. I come from grandparents who were the sole survivors of Holocaust in Europe. And I was very, very close to them. I have another set of grandparents that are refugees from Syria that had to walk out of Syria to escape for their, for their lives. Then I have a set of, you know, so these are, this is like my ancestry. My parents are also immigrants and refugees. And then I am an immigrant myself to the US and you know part of the it's not just the immigration but part of the experiences in life I think I've had it like somehow coded in my DNA I also have obviously my own you know experiences of life and then I, I think that got me to question what is trauma when I, I grew up in Venezuela and I grew up in a community of uh, a lot of immigrants a lot of Holocaust survivors and a lot of um like refugees from different parts of the world. And I always ask that myself that question, like how is it that some people are super depressed, they're not doing well, they're basically surviving and mm -hmm. trying to keep up. And there's other people that are really transforming themselves and not just themselves, but everybody around them. They mm -hmm. create community, they have a purpose, they move forward, they appreciate life. They have this thing of like, they have like some 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 con spiritual connection and they are able to really enjoy life in a different way and i was thinking how people even get to enjoy after going through such difficult moments and then it got me to really of course uh, from a professional point of view i always was very curious from research in studying about dissociation and the different uh, defenses for trauma and how you know and resiliency and all of that and in my practice, I I also got to see not just working like you like you introduced me to very difficult traumatic 
uh, events in communities' lives and patients' lives, but also everyday trauma. So even when we're not just talking about earthquakes or war or accidents or death, we're talking about people that are experiencing some sort of trauma in their everyday lives, maybe bullying, uh, a bad relationship, problems with parents, um, changing voluntarily from one country to another. These are all also possibilities and opportunities to have this springboard of, uh, of having a quantum leap in your transformation in life. So for me, that's a fascinating thing for me to see in my office, to work with it, to offer that as a, as a possibility as a, for, for, for patients to know there is hope after trauma. There is something after that, that if you go through it, you can get it. Yeah, interesting. And, and that is a good point to, to start to ask. Uh, what exactly is post-traumatic growth? Uh, how would you define? It? Wait, can we actually? Can we actually before? Because I, I feel so like in terms of yeah, well, no, just yeah, but in terms of pacing, yeah. Can we actually start off with what is trauma and what are some of the symptoms of okay. it, right? So That's before we go into yeah, some of the sort of brighter parts of it, which I love and definitely, obviously, we're going to talk about. But yeah, so how do we define trauma? Because I think in sort of pop culture, there are various definitions, yes. and obviously, you as a clinical psychologist can give the one that's pretty much accepted, you know, upon by medical standards. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So I'm going to give you the uh, accepted definition of trauma is overwhelming experiences for which we don't have the resources or the tools to face it, okay? Mm -hmm. That's a very, very basic experience. It used to be that the definition of trauma, maybe I would say 20, 30 years ago, was an extraordinary experience that affects your life because it was referred specifically to uh, soldiers mm -hmm. and survivors of war and military. And where that's when we started to understand that PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, began to be part of our culture, be, began to be part of our language, and it became an accepted clinical diagnosis. It was it was hard. It took a it took a while to for that to be accepted. But this is the thing: the live the life we live now, the society we're in now. I think the concept of trauma has to be expanded. And the way that I I understand trauma and the way I work with trauma is this. Trauma is relational, meaning like everything that happens to us is in relationship, either to ourselves, to others, or to the world. And trauma disrupts the relationship, either with ourselves, with others, or with the world. So that's one thing. The other thing is trauma is subjective. What does that mean? That trauma is not what I tell you that you are traumatized. Trauma is what you tell me what that you feel traumatized. You understand? Mm -hmm. so for me, for example, getting divorced might not was not traumatic. But my friend getting divorced was the worst trauma she's ever had in her life. Mm -hmm. Who am I to say that being getting divorced is traumatic or not? You see what I mean? Yeah. And then the, th the third thing is that trauma is not, you know, sometimes people speak in, uh, about trauma in a very colloquial way. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm traumatized. Oh, this is so traumatic. Okay. You know, we can use it as part of the language. But it really is when it, when it like shatters the belief system that you have shatters your understanding about how you function, how the relationship functions with somebody else and how the world functions. So for example, the pandemic was a very good example of collective trauma because for a lot of people, their understanding of the world was like, what? How, how does the world work? Like, uh, uh, how, is, how is health working? What, what is death? Why are people dying? How, why are we in confinement? You know, what's happening here for some people was like, I don't, you know, the understanding of like how everything is connected or how the, how governments don't have all the answers to everything or how the relationship in which they're being confined for two months doesn't work the way they thought they was working. So a lot of shattering of beliefs and assumptions, that's mm -hmm. traumatic too. And trauma can be individual and trauma can be collective. So, you know, the, those are all kinds of the kinds of definitions that I'm offering to expand this concept. Yeah. And I think what you're also saying is that the distinction between sort of a reaction to trauma is uh, it's kind of dimensional. So you have anywhere from, let's say, somebody grieving in terms of normal grief to, let's say, going up, maybe going into what's called complicated grief, according to the DSM, and then maybe even going higher into, let's say, post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's so interesting. I mean, in terms of what you know, or in terms of what you've sort of now we're going into the more so the post-traumatic growth territory, what are sort of some of the factors that, and I mean, I know this is sort of hard to tease out, uh, but 
what are some of the factors that do contribute to a really difficult response, right? So we started talking about resources or lack thereof. So can we talk a little bit about that? And so how do we, what are, what are sort of some, let me see how I can phrase this. What are some of the, uh, not just stressors, but what are some of the vulnerabilities that sort of encompass a person's environment that make it more likely for them to experience a trauma, traumatic yes. response? You know, interesting because a lot of people don't ask me that question. So I appreciate that question. And actually, the way I call it is floating factors. But mm -hmm. this is my own invention of what it is. Mm -hmm. But is that factors that can either be protective factors to face trauma or they can be at risk factors? So, for example, a child that is experiencing trauma, that it doesn't have a support system, that doesn't have a one good uh, relationship with an adult that doesn't have maybe some freedom to move around or to process in a creative way their trauma can probably be, be more traumatized than a child. They can probably be, yeah, more traumatized than a child that does have all these things, <clears throat> that has the support, that has an adult that is reliable, that has a creative outlet, you know, so that's for one. Another, another factor is culture. When a woman, let's say, is being sexually abused or is being molested, if you're in a culture where that can be talked about or at least expressed or have some sort of uh, way in which that she can be, you know, uh, dealing with it or healing from it, probably it's going to allow for the healing of trauma much more than in a country or in a culture where she's so oppressed She's so invisible that she's not even able to mention those words or to even consider it. So culture, I mean, fam, I mean, and these things are tricky because the same factor that can be detrimental or risky can also be protective at times. So it depends. Like, you know, if you're a person that ruminates and that overthinks, you know, there, there's, there's research that shows that when you overthink and overthink and are obsessive in your thinking and stay stuck with it, I mean, who hasn't done it? I mean, everybody has it. But when, you, when you're when you in it a lot more, and I think, you know, nowadays, I think we're tending to do that more. That's probably more detrimental for the for trauma than you are, than if you use those thinking moments in a very intentional way. So you hmm. spend an hour on your day to think about the problem, to come up with solutions in a very like orderly and like with limits and not like let it be an obsessive kind of thinking. So it's the same kind of thing. It's the same thinking, but it's how you use it, for example. Mm -hmm. Same with resilience. That's the other, you know, thing that I talk about resilience in a very, in a controversial way in some way, because everybody loves resilience. Resilience is a very fashionable word mm -hmm. these days. And nothing wrong with it. I love resilience too. I think, I mean, it's a wonderful thing to be, to bounce back, to be strong, to have the tools to, to deal with conflict or adversity. The thing with resilience is that when you're so resilient and you're so much in your bubble of protection in dealing with things, your whatever happens in your life that can be traumatic doesn't allow you to crack in some mm. way, which is not, not easy. It's painful. But then it allows you to expand. Do you see what I mean? So people that are very, very, very resilient might not get to this other stage that I'm talking about that is the post-traumatic growth, that is the, the transformation. Because they're doing well. They're doing ba basically well, which, right. again, nothing wrong with that. But in order to get to that transformation and to get to that like other understanding of yourself, other level of consciousness, there has to be some sort of like death. There's some sort of cracking, some sort of like difficult, painful. And that's what I've seen. I mean, so this is not what I'm proposing. This is what I've seen. That when only when people really crack up and when people really fall apart in some way is that when, when really all these things begin to grow and begin to happen. Yeah, that, that actually makes a lot of sense to me, right? Um, I happen to consider myself very uh, resilient, but then... I, I can see how having that layer of of protection, even though you're able to function and it doesn't that that traumatic event or whatever it is that's bothering you doesn't necessarily get to you. That's good on one level, but on another level, you're not truly embracing how that event made you feel and truly coming to terms with it. So I can see how 
you wouldn't be able to, there, there's a, there's a limit to how much growth you can possibly get yes. from being so resilient. And you know what I would also exactly. add to that? So we, we talk about this, uh, sort of frequently, not too frequently, but I know you said this, so I know this is not a secret, but I'm going to kind of mention this because you said this already. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you know, I love that you mentioned culture, right? So Alan and I both, since we're both Russian, we come from the same background, Russian, Ukrainian. So we both come from the same background, right? So I know Alan mentioned this before where he said something along the lines of like, uh, where he tried to keep relationships very surface level and didn't really talk about sort of deeper things and deeper feelings. And that's very cultural. So if anybody kind of listening knows anything about our culture, okay. everything is sort of suppressed, right? So we're, we're really big on hyper femininity and hyper masculinity. So right. to be a man is essentially to just handle your business and then leave everybody else alone. Don't bother anybody. So I feel like for a lot of us, especially when we were kids, some of the stuff, since you mentioned bullying, and this was really prominent and prevalent to me, uh, when I was bullied as a kid, I really didn't feel like I could talk about it to anybody. So with my mom, she kind of tended to over react and her thing was like oh my god i'm gonna go fix this for you which was embarrassing and my stepdad at the time would just be like hey dude like what do you you can fix this like just figure it out like what are you doing like if you feel fight if you have to fight or whatever so for a lot of us there was nobody to really turn to and i remember thinking and i'm not gonna mm. say the school itself was problematic because i don't i mean there were problematic elements in it but i feel like because of the culture there wasn't even sort of an impetus to tell anybody because if you mm. couldn't share any of those experiences at home why would you go share them with strangers yeah. so now you have this background where you have people who are supposed to care for you and supposed to listen to you, take your feelings seriously. And, you know, you're being essentially told in one way or another that not only do your feelings not matter, but they're actually like inordinate. They don't, they're not really sort of relevant, right? And plus, even if you did, even if you were vulnerable, uh, it's not like they had all the tools necessary yeah. to be able to um, actually hash that out with you. So True. even if there was a moment of bravery and you did actually say how you feel, uh, they might actually be uh, reactive. They might not ask you the origins of that feeling and try to right. talk it out with you. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, on on the note of uh, that whole surface level, keeping people at a distance thing. Yeah. Uh, I would notice that people, if I got to know them deeply enough, um, they would have a concept of who they think you are mm -hmm. and then just judge you based on that concept. So sometimes I would keep, I would then learn to keep interactions very surface level, like pleasant. So this way they couldn't possibly get a concept of who I am. This way it's always in this like sort of ethereal area where then our interactions will always be good because I'm not being vulnerable enough for you to okay. form a concept. Right. Yeah. Which is protective totally. from further trauma. <laughs> totally. And you know, you're talking about something that is intimacy yeah. and intimacy is not just sexual intimacy or it's that kind of a connection that is an emotional social intimacy that really requires some vulnerability and it requires some transparency into who you are and when you don't have a system around that supports that it takes a lot of courage to mm -hmm. allow yourself even to say okay let me be open to who I am or let me be truthful to my own intimate em emotions because yes what you get is that then re-traumatized because you're being crushed that line of how open you are or how connected you are with your feelings and being validated is a very fine line I mean as a, the example of bullying is such a great example because if you're a kid and you decide to to be to take the risk to open especially as a man Especially mm -hmm. as a boy, you know, in cultures like, you know, Ukraine, Russia, I'm, I come from Venezuela, so same. Mm -hmm. Like, and say, say, tell your mom, hey, you know, I'm being bullied. Oh, it's so hard. What? I mean, either you have the complete indifference or you have the overreaction, which then brings even worse consequences in at school because your, your parents, when I, your mother wants to protect you, wants to take over the power from you and say, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to protect my baby. I'm not going to let anyone hurt it. But when with that attitude, what it does is that instead of, instead of strengthening the relationships between you and your friends and have that work of repair and intimate connections, she is going, she might go to school and just take over and say, you know, don't touch my, my son and everybody else is wrong. And what it does is polarizes. But this is such a perfect example for political situations and social situations as well. You know what I mean? Because this is a microcosm of something bigger that happens too. And mm -hmm. then you get like the good ones and the bad ones and the separation. And then instead of healing trauma through connection, which is what we need to do, we're doing, we're, what we're doing is fragmenting even more. And that's the problem with trauma because trauma keeps fragmenting and fragmenting and isolating. 
And that's mm-hmm. really like a huge consequence of trauma. And I'm sure as a bully kid, you probably were super, you were probably feeling very isolated and, and probably like not being able to share your feelings, you know, as with your friends or, you know, I'm just using the, the, the two examples, yeah, right. keeps you, keeps you in isolation, you know, keeps you even more isolated. It's like, if I share how I feel, they might reject me. If I don't share how I feel, I'm not being authentic. I'm not being real. And nobody really knows me. Nobody really knows who I am. So mm-hmm. it's like, what do you do? You know? Yeah. And it's also like, you know, the thinking is, it's like, if I'm already being ex- rejected for sort of external aspects of myself, why wouldn't I then also on top of that now be rejected for internal aspects of myself? So for me, <laughs> I'm like, I just wanted to hide everything away as much as I possibly yeah. could, both internal mm-hmm. and external. So exactly. either, why do you, why do you think we kind of tend to do that? Right. So why do you think we tend to personalize and sort of see ourselves as the problem when something like bullying happens, but you know, trauma in general? Oh, yeah, well, I'm going to give you the very neuropsychological answer because I kept asking myself, like, why is it that we always focus on the negative? Mm-hmm. Why is it that, you know, traumatic behavior and traumatic experiences or suffering always surfaces so much more and we focus so much time and energy and every patient that I have has the thing. It doesn't matter if, he ha- if the person has a million good things the bad thing is the one that we keep focusing. And I'm like, what is it? Until I understood one of the explanations is that we're wired for survival, right? Mm-hmm. We are, this is all of us beings, you know, animals, uh, humans, and every every species is wired for survival. And this wiring for survival and, and all of our senses are, are here to keep us alive and are here to keep us you know, being able to stay and reproduce and anything that we, that, you know, that means that being alive in a very basic form. Our brain also is wired to, for that survival mode. I mean, it, it looks for food, it looks for oxygen, it looks for shelter, it looks for reproduction. So all of that is like the way that automatically we are. How do we keep in survival? By scanning the environment constantly and by looking at what's menacing and what's dangerous, right? Mm-hmm. So when we identify that, we focus on the dangerous situation so we can either run away from it, right? Either fight it or it freeze, right? Fight, flight, or freeze. That's when we have this very, and, and fawn, that's like a fourth ex- response, right? And this is, we don't, we we're born knowing this. This is not something that we learn and we're, we're making up. This is our, our basic, basic way of functioning. So when we, when we scan the environment, we don't look for the positive things and we don't look for the wow, the, you know, what gives us pleasure. We keep looking for things that are painful and difficult. And that's what becomes our main focus. And that's what gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's where we're, even if we have a hundred things, positive things, it's like the negative thing and the dangerous thing and the, menacing thing the threatening you know situation that stays with us because we keep needing to resolve it Mm -hmm. that's one that's one that's more like the neuropsychology like you know the survival and the other response is that in order for us to be based like very very balanced healthy human beings we need to have what um when one of the psychologists called the good enough mother so Mm -hmm. Meaning like the very early stages in life, and Freud talked about this, but then all the descendants from from Melanie Klein and other people that when you have a child that is being born the first couple of years, I mean, uh, maybe until seven, but even like the first year or two, to have that very basic attachment connection of security, of predictability, of like comfort Mm. has to be there for you to like begin to wire yourself in a way where you trust, you basically trust everything around you and you trust yourself. When that is not there, you already from the beginning are learning that life is unpredictable, that you're unprotected, that everything is disorganized, that you can get hurt, that, you know, like things, things don't go, don't go flow and smooth and that you don't, you don't trust your environment. And, you know, we do, we do this, with the best of intentions. I mean, parents raise their children with all the love and all, uh, the best that they can do, but not mm-hmm. necessarily they're providing this very, very basic way of secure attachment for then that human being to flourish in a way that it's like more uh, healthy and balanced. So 
Yes. All right. So what I hear you saying is that on the one hand, if let's say I'm personalizing, it's because it sort of helps aid my survival. So if I'm in an environment that I have control over, the idea is if I sort of change some things about myself, then let's say I'll no longer be bullied. Uh, I'll no longer be sort of, uh, I don't know, mistreated or whatever, you know, globally, generally speaking. And then on the other hand, what we're saying is that if you had a good upbringing, you know, likelihoods, we're not obviously talking about certainties, but the likelihood is that you'll take that sort of personalized, that automatic thought and you'll remind yourself, no, no, this really isn't about me. Maybe something's going on with this person. Maybe they have a really difficult home life, but, you know, because I know that I'm loved and I know that I'm lovable. So what we're talking about, again, going back to vulnerabilities is that sort of our evolutionary inheritance to sort of be hypervigilant, right, to an extent. And then also the inheritance I get that we, I guess that we get from either neglect or parental mistreatment on the whole is that that sort of opens us up and again, makes us vulnerable to try, to stress responses. Yes, yes. And I want to clarify that it's not just having a great childhood. It's really, even in the worst of childhoods, having a secure attachment is very different because it's not like having privilege and having all the opportunities and, mm -hmm. you know, having, you know, parents that are beautiful and rich. No, it's like having that one person in your life growing up that really provides a sense of like connection that is there, that is present, that is that you know you can count on. And that's mm -hmm. very different because sometimes it's not the parent, sometimes it's the uh, soccer coach or sometimes it's the music teacher, sometimes it's the nanny, sometimes mm -hmm. it's, you know, but it's this one person in your life that provides that. Um, because, you know, and, you know, you, you have environments in which everything seems beautiful from the outside, but in the, in that person, those people grow up with a lot of trauma from the relationship with their parents and actually those are difficult vulnerabilities to talk about, right? Because I can, you know, you can see the, you can see both of you and say, Hey, but you did well. Okay. You're from Russia, from Ukraine, but you're, you look good. You did well. You're doing well. You live in a, in a great place. You're working well. Okay. Yeah. But what, what are those microaggressions that happen? What are those chronic traumatic developmental experiences that are so hard to talk about? And sometimes we don't even have a language because we experienced those when we were little when we were kids and we didn't even have the language to express or to de describe what was that, you know, very difficult relationship that we, that we had going on. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's levels to it, right? Even, even if you are able to be vulnerable, um, uh, first of all, even the undertaking of attempting to be vulnerable is, is hard, right? I mean, I've had times where, um, someone's asked me like, essentially, what's going on uh let's let's talk about this what's and, and they get very like in a deep sort of emotional state and then i try to find the words to say what it is that i want to say and then i'll even have a lot of pauses like like i i almost want to communicate but i'm afraid of the next thing i'm going to even say so even being able to just be at that level to just first open up and then to communicate it yeah. feels like there's yeah these these stages to it essentially so when you have when you have a good one good corrective experience <clears throat> and that's that's uh, a very famous psychologist called young mm -hmm. and that would say the corrective like emotionally corrective experience what does that mean when you go to therapy let's say <clears throat> and you do open up like you're doing with me right now a little bit and say this is what happens <laughs> or this is what i'm afraid <laughs> And you go through the experience with the therapist in in live in the moment. Mm -hmm. You you really feel that like that other person understood me. That other person is not is embracing what I'm saying. It's not judgmental. It's empathic. It's sensitive to what I'm saying. And you keep having these experiences, even if it's in an environment of therapy. You begin to integrate in you mm -hmm. that understanding but not from the head but it's more like a body understanding in your body you understand oh this is what it feels like to trust mm -hmm. this is what it feels like to be seen than to be understood and then hmm, I'm, I'm gonna venture out and try it with somebody else but you mm -hmm. really have to have that first experience with somebody that is absolutely safe and that's really the second stage in my five stage model it's like the first stage, which is radical acceptance, you really, you truly, like you're doing now, like you're doing now. I radically accept that, I mean, I, I have, I'm, I'm not, I don't trust. And it's hard for me to be vulnerable. And I've, I've gone through this and that and the other traumatic experience. So that's the first, and embrace that. 
-hmm. But the second stage, which is the staking safety and protection, is when you choose one person even in your life that you know that is going to be reliable and that is going to be non gentle is going to allow you to express this feeling in a very, very safe environment. Very mm -hmm. safe. So, you know, that's, so that's what happens. You begin to integrate this, this kind of feelings and, and say, oh, wow, well, you know, it can be feel, felt this way. It can be seen this way. I, I'm really understanding this from a different place. And then it mm -hmm. takes you then to whatever the, the third stage and the fourth and the fifth. But that's, that's, that's pretty much, you're, you're on the right track. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I, I definitely know. I love that no, because uh, yeah, that, that integration in, in a safe environment would then lead me to probably feel safer to doing that out there with, with someone else. Uh, just, I mean, I won't get too much into this. Well, of course, you know, get True. into post-traumatic growth, but uh, yeah, no, I, I've had uh, a moment where I got, uh, I was incredibly vulnerable um, with, uh, so this was like um, um, the start of a relationship essentially. Right. And um, I said, okay, I completely trust this person. I'm going to be completely vulnerable, say everything that's on my mind, everything that I'm feeling and be completely truthful. Let's try this. Right. <laughs> uh, I did it. So, okay, good. I did it. But then, um, I guess that wasn't a particularly safe person to, to do it with, or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm projecting something on them. I could, I could have a blind spot and think it's them, not me, <clears throat> all of that. If but, I but... think I know who you're talking about, they're not a safe person. <laughs> <laughs> Which has to be fair, right? Good that so, you have Leon on your side. Yeah. You have, but you know what? Who's to say? Who's who's telling you that in any relationship with your with a partner, you have to be absolutely and completely open and vulnerable about everything? Right. I don't know if that's really you know. I know that's like the ideal and like you know what we see in movies and all of that. But in reality, I think we have so many parts in ourselves and so many components. And what we choose to share with each relationship, it's precious and sacred and beautiful, but might be different. You know, what you share with Leon is one thing, what you share with your girlfriend is another thing, what you mm -hmm. share with her. And it's, they're all truthful parts and they're all authentic and they're all real, but you don't have to put all of them with one person, not necessarily, right. you know? Right. Right. Yeah, there has to be a, a level of tact as well. It's not all about this beautiful, authentic sharing of this the my stream of consciousness, right? right. That's fair. exactly yeah, exactly that's fair. exactly yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then you know now that we're kind of on the subject, right? Because I think we're now getting into the sort of problem or the I guess the topic of interpretations and how people interpret and even misinterpret trauma. So in your kind of in your growth model, how do we start now thinking about interpreting it or reinterpreting it? And how does the safety of a therapist help a person have a deeper and a sort of not just a less personal because I want it to be a little bit more life changing than that, but a sort of more transformative understanding of the trauma yeah and actually let me just say post-traumatic growth is the positive consequences that come out of a traumatic experience right so it's a very it's a very tricky thing to say like how you know how come how can you even put like even the title the unexpected gift of trauma you know the title of my book some yeah. of my patients are like but indeed how can you say there's a gift to trauma i don't feel it it's very difficult it might even be you know rejectful to say no don't talk to, don't talk to me about gift if i if i'm in the middle of this very traumatic experience and they're right when you're in the midst of that it's very difficult to talk about anything that is positive but as we know, and as research shows, and of course, in my clinical experiences, I said, as you go through the stages and as you go through this process, you get to that. So when first stage, radical acceptance, second stage, that's seeking safety and protection, not only Leon from a therapist, but from any, any person, any group, any community that would embrace you in a safe way. You know, for some people it might mean going to church on Sunday and having that community where you can cry and you can share and you can see, and that might be a safe place. For some other people it might be going on a pilgrimage in I don't know which mountain and getting in touch with themselves or with the guru that they're with. So it doesn't necessarily have to be, I don't say it's just in therapy. Obviously therapy is one amazing thing, but then you're going to, when, when you open up and when you express and when you start learning more about yourself, you go into the third stage of the new narratives. You, you start to rewrite 
the story of who you are. Those, those shattered belief systems that no longer worked, you start finding new belief systems. Okay, you know, these little people are like, hmm, let me read this book. I, I mean, I'm curious about what other people are doing, what other philosophical ways of thinking there are there, maybe other practices, maybe problems. This is typical when people get into every podcast, every retreat, every, you know, they go do yoga. I don't know what, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Like, yeah. you know, they change houses, they change friends, they start dressing differently. They change careers. You know, this is a typical thing. I used to be at corporate at the highest level and then I break down and then I, yeah, and I understood and then I left the corporate world or I left Wall Street and now I'm a yoga teacher or I am, a, you know, open a center for abuse children. I don't know. You see what I mean? Mm. It's like this, this really rebirthing that begins to happen. And then you connect with, with other things that were not accessible to you before, because you were in your one line. And then the, the right. And then the fourth well, stage. Is actually, the- before, before, can I actually just really quickly add on to, cause I love that. Right. So the narrowness, right. So that's actually what I find in my clinical practice too. So when you're sort of seeped into and deep into trauma, all you see is the narrowness of that experience. Yeah. So what I find with clients is that let's say when, obviously we as children, we all learn cause and effect, right? So let's say if I do something, the world responds to me in a particular way. So what I often tell, like, let's say a patient who is struggling with some sort of traumatic experience is that let's say you see a diet, right? You see the combination and th- this is the event. You see the dyad between you and the person who affected you in whatever way, whether it was a mistreatment, abuse, whatever it is, right? So you see yourself as sort of being there and having a response to you. So automatically you think, why did this happen to me? Why did this person to do, do this to me, mm-hmm. right? Like, why did my dad leave me? Uh, so this was a question that I had as a child because I don't know my father. And I was like, why did my dad mm-hmm. leave me, right? What did that mm-hmm. I did, right? So, but then what's so interesting is now when we're sort of opening that lens is now what you're finding is the person that develops a curiosity about the other, right? So what is it that's about the other that could have maybe made him act or her, uh, made that person act in such a way to me that really had very little to do with me. And then maybe you find out about their relationships with other people. Uh, maybe you find out about different traumas and experiences that they had. And then now when you have this broader perspective of the relationship, now you understand that this person probably didn't do this to you as opposed to them just doing this mostly to themselves. This like they have this sort of negative pattern of ruining their relationship, sabotaging, right. avoiding right. them. Uh, yeah, so it's it, and it's based on their own past experiences, whatever it's they are. It's so true. It's so true. You know, the fourth agreement, you know, you, have you heard of the fourth, the the four fourth agreement. the four agreements and not taking anything personal? Yeah. But also when you expand on your vision of, of others in the world, what you develop is that compassion, right? Like that compassion, like, oh, yeah, my dad probably was very a troubled man that had so much trauma or so many things going on that he couldn't even appreciate the relationship with a son, you know, and had like, and of course it's still hurt. And of course this is not a way of, of, of justifying, right? But there's a, it's not just one dimensional, the way that you see the situation. It's like, okay, that person had that, but it also had all these other elements going on that make the, the, the situation much more complex than, right. than the one where we right. see it on. And the other thing is, and this is, I think, really hard for a lot of us to accept, there's a sort of randomness to it, meaning that it's like if I weren't his son and he had another son, he would have rejected that son too, and probably the next kid and the kid after that. So you're thinking like, oh my God, wow, this is this is so impersonal that there's right. nothing I could have done. It doesn't even matter if I were a completely different person, this person still wouldn't have wanted to be in my life. And, and then how does that make, is that a relief when you know yeah. that? Yes, yeah. it's a relief. Yeah, completely, this is not like- me. Yeah, it's not it's, me. There's nothing wrong yeah. with me, right? There's yeah. nothing wrong with me. It's not something that I did. Yes, and that's super important. And then I'm sure, again, that that that's very much post-traumatic growth. And I'll tell you yeah. why. Because from that wound, Leon, and maybe we'll, we'll have this conversation some other day, but I'm sure that from that wound, some of what you're doing now, being a clinician, being a therapist, being having a podcast that is called Seize the Moment, has a lot to do, right, with that not have that adult that wasn't there in the way that he should have been in the, the responsible way and that how you are processing and understanding all of that which is literally what i talk what i say what post-traumatic growth is it's because the fourth stage is the stage of integration right you integrate your old self your traumatic self with the new found way of being that you have and you have this both end you're a whole person you don't you don't react to your past like 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 the way that you're talking about now about your dad 
like you're able to talk about it without crying, without being re-traumatized, without like being shaken all over again. So you, you've you integrated this and that takes you to the fifth stage, which is wisdom and growth. Mm -hmm. And that's the stage where you turn the pain into purpose when you turn the breakdown into breakthrough when you find that medicine in the wound that you have you know and, 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 I, and I love seeing that I love it because people become so much more confident and they have that sense of strength inside you know a sense a self that is like capable of facing difficult things this is where spiritual awakening happens usually people are so much more connected spiritually and I don't mean religious I mean more like there's a sense of interconnectedness with others and with the world and with higher beings or whatever you want to call it. But like the, you have those peak experiences. And this is where you understand more like the mission in your life when you have a sense of purpose, like you know your priorities much better. When your relationships are a little more meaningful, more deep, like all these transformations have happened. And it's not like you stop being yourself, but you're like really have taken this to another level. Yeah, I love that. And uh, Alan, was it, I don't know if you said this before, but it's in my mind that you did. So is it that the thinking was for the podcast that we would provide information that we kind of wish we had ourselves when we were younger? So uh, yeah, <laughs> essentially, you know, uh, at least from, from my side, uh, you might notice a book back there. Uh, it's called The Power of Now. So mm -hmm. the uh, yeah. Yeah. So I read that book in my early 20s. So 10 plus years ago, pretty much. And for me, the, the knowledge that was in that book was so practical, so different, so radically different from how I understood how the world worked that I was thinking, oh, okay, like this concept of being uh, present, right? Or this idea of ego, like, oh, this voice that's in my head, I'm identifying with it. I think that is me, this, this ruminating voice. And like, even the, even just something as simple as that, and then being, uh, realizing, oh, that's not me, who I am is greater than that, um, was a huge radical shift in my understanding, because what thoughts would come to me, like, uh, like, that would just automatically come to me, I was thinking that's just me narrating to myself or me just brainstorming or me thinking about what's going on as opposed to this is just completely just automatic based like from conditioning it's not the same as thoughts that come to you in a, in a state of uh of brainstorming and that sort of thing so to the back to the main point though i was thinking oh i'm nobody special uh if i all of a sudden uh can see the world completely differently uh, the, these thoughts that for many people are the cause of a lot of unnecessary suffering in the world, right? What if you could can this in a way that's, uh, that could be uh, popularized, which that does count as a version of that 100%. But what if you could get this information out to as many people as possible? What kind of ripple effects could, could that have uh, societally or culturally? Mm, e no. Even if I'm not the one to essentially do it okay i'm a contributor of it somebody else can be a contributor yeah. of it and who knows uh what effect that can have and yeah that that's the idea uh, behind the well, the i love i love that i love your mission i think it's a beautiful thing and that's why i think we're on the same line in the sense that the book is also with the mission of like providing that awareness to say hey there's another way of understanding what's going on with you that can be so much more hopeful and positive and transformational and like to really take it to like let's see what we're doing this that is meaningful that it's conscious you know with consciousness that is with intention and not just going around the world auto automatically in like yeah. you know autopilot but because of all the all the beliefs uh, that we, we got, uh, inherited from our parents or from really from our ancestors that are were not positive you know right, or that right. were not useful or that we're not doing well in the same way that we had some very positive ones you know it's not like sure. it's not all bad but like to be aware which ones you want to take and which ones you don't which ones are you repeating are you repeating the cycles from where you come from right and say you're i'm just doing what my parents did and my, what my grandparents did or are you really stopping and being that agent that disruptive agent and saying hey you know the story stops with me and I'm not going to repeat all this bad stuff that happened in my family or in my culture or in my country. And I'm just going to, you know, do something different. And it, mm -hmm. it does take a lot of strength and a lot of courage. And this is what I think this 
you know, it's all like having that language and that permission to say, let's, let's disrupt that and let's write it in a different way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love that. <laughs> no, no, no. So yeah, no, no, no. so I was gonna ask you know, so somebody might be listening to this and they might say, well, these all these ideas they sound great, right? And it sounds like practically speaking, like maybe some of this could happen, but I don't. I want to know how to do it, right? What are sort of some examples that we see in maybe pop culture or just kind of around us that we could say, oh wow, that's a person who probably experienced post traumatic growth. I'll tell you, I you know somebody that you know is Lady Gaga. I always mm. use her as an example because she comes from sexual abuse mistreatment you know having a very difficult childhood in like in the way that she tried to be be an artist and and she you know hang out with very uh, i would say wrong people for her and she didn't talk about it for a long time but when she did she was so mindful and vulnerable and truthful about how she talked about her experience of being afraid to share her her abuse and her vulnerabilities, uh, she was how she was believing in therapy until she was, uh, how she was using drugs to calm her pain, like her physical pain. She went, she was in a lot of physical pain. That was a reflection of her emotional pain as well, and the process that she went through was incredible. How she talks about it. There's that one specific interview with Oprah that she really describes it so well. I was so impressed. And then you see it in how, in some way, very consistent she is with her work, like the foundations that she opened, the people that she supports. I mean, I'm not saying that she's perfect, no, or anybody is, but the line that she followed in her healing her trauma and how she's done it collectively also to give back to the community and to protect those people that maybe have experienced what she has experienced in the past and how she's understanding it and articulating it and advocating for getting therapy and getting help and getting the right, you know, resources. I think it's a wonderful example of post-traumatic growth. I mean, let you know, obviously we have Prince Harry who's talking about all his trauma and how he's transformed. I don't know. That's like, um, it's more commercialized, but LeBron, LeBron James. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. You know, that's, those are amazing examples of post-traumatic growth. Hmm. And what are, what are some strategies that let's say someone who uh, just, it doesn't have to be someone who recently went through trauma, but someone who's been through it. What are some things that they can do to sort of get them towards uh, that post-traumatic growth? So I I would say this doesn't happen by yourself and it doesn't happen in isolation. So begin Mm -hmm. to be curious about your responses of like when you feel triggered, when you are having disproportionate reactions to things that happen around you, when you feel like you're fighting with everybody around or you're withdrawing or you're being very disconnected or numb, you know, you're not, like nothing, you're indifferent about everything or you don't feel any. Like be curious about what's happening to you. Take mm-hmm. a pause and say like, hmm, maybe this is connected to something else and not just what's happening with me right now. Maybe it's connected to other experiences. And seek help. Like try to find a, one safe person of play, or place where you where you want to share this with, where you want to start a conversation. Maybe this podcast is, you know, ringing a bell into something or open opening up for a, a deeper thought or memory or connection and just follow that thread and be aware of what your body is telling you our bodies by the way are the most perfect and amazing uh place to be aware of what's happening to us our bodies are constantly sending us signals constantly telling us what's happening not not just physically i'm talking mentally emotionally and psychologically so if you pay attention to your body and what hurts and where and how how's your digestion how's your sleep how's your all of that are just other ways in which we are all connected to what's happening and if you really really read into your body and into what's happening you're gonna begin to understand more and that's i think a, a gift yeah. Oh, oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. So I actually want to go into that a little bit because sometimes you meet people where they'll say something like, well, I, I've never experienced any trauma. And then they have these particular sort of bodily symptoms that nobody can really assess, right? They don't understand where they're coming from. So what would that be like? What are some of the sort of psychosomatic correlations with the history of trauma that people might not even be aware of? Well, can you believe, I mean, there are amazing examples from the 1800s and 1900s with Freud in which he would go into 
attend to all these women. Do you know about these stories? He would go into, mm -hmm. you know, but a lot of people don't know that going to the, the, the society in Vienna in which all these women were, were wanting some help that would come with physical symptoms that they would call hysteria, mm -hmm. which, which was like they didn't feel uh, they were a, a, a limb or a member, or they couldn't feel their bodies or they were going through some physical symptom. And when he dig deeper, when, when he started to have these conversations that they, they were called psychotherapy or the psychoanalysis, it was completely related to emotional issues that were either they were being abused or they were going through some difficulty in life. And we see that in today, you know, typically um, in chronic illnesses, our autoimmune illnesses, I mean, there are people that believe that everything that manifests in your body is a has a has a connotation that is emotional, psychological, because it's not separate. We're all, you know, this concept that we have a line here that separates the body from the from the mind is is an illusion, right? We're all one being, and whatever happens with you physically has an equivalent in psychologically or emotionally, and the other way around. So it's pretty much everything is connected to how we feel. <laughs> yeah, so and how just, we feel is connected to our body. So if you're super stressed, you know, you might have more headaches or you might have, you know, like rushes in your body. Or if you are going through grief and you lost somebody and all of a sudden you can't eat as well anymore, or you can't sleep anymore. Uh, typical uh, symptoms of uh, of trauma are hyper hyper vigilance, flashbacks, loss of memory. Uh, when you're, you know, you don't, you're, you're dissociated, that you can't have the emotion related to the thoughts that you have. Uh, you have palpitations, you have uh, sweating, you know, these are all physical symptoms related to traumatic experiences. So there's this, um, that's interesting. What you're talking about reminds me of a, of a book I read. Um, it's called Letting Go by David mm -hmm. R. Hawkins. Yeah. So um, in, in the book, um, he talks about actually going i mean essentially through a way of meditation essentially and breathing uh going into your body and feeling those um sensations that we're talking about essentially and trying to go into them so much as to with these breathing practices and meditation essentially let go of these feelings because a lot of these feelings are repressed uh essentially or suppressed i should say and um, that's actually very interesting because I know, for example, uh, Leon at his uh, clinic, you, you do essentially cognitive behavioral therapy, right? Mm -hmm. Which is which is an amazing method uh, through via through thought or that um, what's that record called? Oh, the, the th cognitive thought record, right? Cognitive yeah. thought record. Yeah, like there there are amazing, beautiful things in uh, CBT, right? But it it was interesting to me. It was one of the first times I was introduced to the idea of actually going into your body and feeling the emotions because there is a sense I, I could see how based on you feeling these different sensations in your body and uh, quote unquote, letting go of them. I mean, you could see how they could be the root of what might grow into thousands of different thoughts that could end up in rumination or bad feelings or sorry, in a feedback loop between the thoughts and the, and the feelings. Mm -hmm. Um, this is going to be a weird question because I, I kind of know the answer, but uh, let's let's see where this goes. But w w do you think that um, any particular method of uh, combating, not combating, of embracing how you feel, whether it's through CBT or necessarily feeling your emotions is superior to the other? Or does the CBT have like limitations by not going into the feelings? So in the book in my book i actually have a whole page of lists of so many methods mm -hmm. i am more of a relational kind of therapist than in general so more than the title if you like leon is cbt or what it's who that person is right if right. you're able to establish a relationship or even you know you go to a doctor or you go to a Guru and who, what kind of relationship you establish with the other person is really already part of the healing and part of mm -hmm. what what happens and and also each person might have a different method you know maybe for some people a more cerebral entry you know might be more accessible and easier than 
um, a very spiritual way of understanding what's happening. Right. For some other people, it might be more medical or more physical. And then from there, you get into other things. You know, you know, you know that our digestive system is another, it has neuro, neurons, it's another brain. So, you yeah. know, there's the, uh, there's a whole uh, clinic, uh, Dr. Amen, he works, he works with, uh, you know, your digestive system in order to deal with depression and bipolar disorder and uh, anxiety disorder. Nothing to do with CBT, nothing. It's right. all what you eat. And it's all about how you digest the food. And that's how he treats the symptoms. So, you know what I mean? It's like, it depends, you know, what calls you and what would be a good entryway for each person. That's why I don't think there's one method. Honestly, you know, psychedelics for some people is the, the best way to really expand your understanding yeah. of yourself and others. And that's how you enter into this journey. So really the, the all the all the journeys, you know, all the roads get to Rome. You know, how did you say that in English? Like yeah. all the walks of life get back get to the same place. It's it doesn't mm. matter where you enter from, as long as you enter. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> um I was wondering, uh so I understand that being um sort of a safe space for someone who's going through uh trauma or uh, going through the process of post-traumatic growth is is a way to help support them is is there anything else that somebody can do or maybe strategies they can do if they happen to know somebody who's going through uh something in a way to to better support them give them my book <laughs> <laughs> that works, um, yeah. right um yeah. which actually i you know this is one of the the populations that i thought of it's not just if you're experiencing the trauma but if you are with somebody that is experiencing trauma and i've had a lot of people buying the book to give it to somebody else because they say, hey, maybe this is a good way of that you become aware of mm -hmm. some of what's happening that you're not connecting and it's hard to talk about. You know, maybe it's hard for me to tell you, you know, you've been traumatized or you you are acting in a way that, but maybe here, read the book and then that, you know, that might, that might click something within you to say, huh, this is interesting. Let me, let me become more aware about it and let me explore a little bit more. So it's mm -hmm. like gentle ways in which with a lot of love, you 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 help the other person to maybe ask questions but not everybody's ready when you're ready and not everybody's ready in the time when they think they should you know it's for some people it takes a lot of time to realize that this is what they have to do some other people are ready in a minute and they go through it so there's no like one particular way mm -hmm. even when you're trying to force the person to do these changes it doesn't happen i mean the typical right. example is like interventions you know for mm. alcohol etc like you have the whole family all the friends the whole community sitting there you you know you're an addict and you have an addiction and you're destroying your life and wow you know it takes some time the whole village and even with that the person doesn't change or even the, with that the person doesn't go through through the changes so it has to come from within it really does yeah and what i but love you about can give them hints you can give them hints Give them yeah. the book and say, "Hey, I think this is good for you." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and what I what I love about literature is that uh, so I have this this comes up with a bunch of my patients where they'll read something and it's sort of like a stepping stone toward talking about it. So it's sort of like dipping your feet in the water. You'll kind of like you have some inkling of what the concept is, but then you'll read about it and then you'll think, "Huh, maybe my therapist would be interested in talking to me about this." And then they'll bring exactly. it up and then we'll talk about it. And then they find that it's sort of getting safer by the moment. They read about it, they feel a little bit more comfortable. Then they talk about it, then they feel a little bit more comfortable. Comfortable, then hopefully they go outside of therapy and bring it up to other people and feel a little yeah, bit more comfortable. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. So hopefully that's what happens. Hopefully that's that's how we create this ripple effect of like bringing more people into awareness and consciousness and compassion. Which I mean, this is what we're talking about, right? Like if we have that expansion of understanding that we're not in this narrow line and everybody is going through something and that things are not personal and that they're we're in this growing process of uh, uh, understanding ourselves and others. There, mm. There's more compassion in the world and there's more ways of dealing with conflict with more peace and less right. fight and less war, right? Which is what we need. Yeah. So, and, and, yeah. And I would say also, it seems like the kind of main takeaway from the show is that trauma doesn't necessarily have to be a spiritual death sentence. Exactly. Trauma is not a life sentence and not a yeah. death sentence. It's the, quite the opposite. If you know that trauma has the possibility of post-traumatic growth, you can get to that. 
Then, yeah. I mean, just by knowing that that's possible, if it, even if you don't feel it in the moment, if you, know, if you can't even see the light at the end of the tunnel, knowing that's a possibility, knowing that other people have gone through it, knowing that even the people that are helping you around have that concept, it, it really, you know, completely changes that. Yeah, and say, I love hey, it. yes, it's a, it's a springboard. It's like, wow, let's take all this bad stuff that is happening to me and take it. What is this for? No, why me? Why me? But the opposite. It's like, why, what is this for? How am I going to use this to be a better person, to evolve, to do, to grow, to become more connected? Right. I love that. All right, Alan, <laughs> final questions for Edith before we wrap up? Oh, yes. Uh, so if we wanted to follow you, follow your work, and of course, buy the book, uh, where can we do that? So please, 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 I will be super excited if you get this book, if you tell me what you think about it, if we continue the conversation, you can get it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Indie, sorry, like a, really every platform, you can have it in Audible, in Kindly, in Kindly, so, so you know, every everywhere. Um, you can find me in uh, Dr. In Instagram, Dr. Edith Shiro, so dr. Edith Shiro, my website, www.dredithshiro.com, uh, Facebook, YouTube that I just opened. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah, and if you have any more questions, call Leon and Alan and they know where to find me. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, we'll, and we can continue talking about it, but I really encourage everybody to really get this book in their hands. So you know make a difference for themselves and others i love Absolutely. it and I, by the way i have to say this uh, this might be my favorite podcast we've ever done wow. i'm not even kidding wow. i'm not even kidding throughout it i'm thinking in my head i'm like like internally like a nod of like i love this this is awesome thank wow. you yeah. what an That's honor it, yeah. thank you thank you please please get the book i really i'm very curious to see what you think of it so please Absolutely. get it yes Absolutely. yes yes All right. thank you so much again for coming on thank this was you. excellent Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the invitation. A lot of love to you guys. Absolutely. Bye. You Talk to you soon. Bye. 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 Ciao, ciao. Okay. Wow. All right. That was, oof, wow. Awesome. So everyone, if you want to follow us, you could follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Facebook and on Instagram and on Twitter. We're at Seize underscore podcast. Like, subscribe, hit the, the bell, bell on YouTube. YouTube. Thank you again so much for watching and see you next time.